So this morning, I have to be honest and say I misspoke. If you remember two weeks ago when we began this sermon series, uh, we spoke of Elijah. This morning, I actually said we spoke of Stephen, and a couple people caught it. And the reason I brought that up is because I've been studying for next week. We will be studying Stephen. Not to give it away, that means you still have to be here, but now you know. Um, we're in the Why Me series. Why me? Why do bad things happen? I'm sure as a Christian, you've had other people ask you that. Well, if your God is, then why? And that's something that we could see, honestly, throughout the whole Bible. This is not a new thing. Why would we expect it to be different for a Christian compared to a non-Christian? Christ said himself that those who believe in me, are, you don't get all jelly donuts. Sometimes you get a hard donut with bad filling. Life is difficult on this earth, but we are not living to be on this earth. We are living for an afterlife and an eternity with Christ Jesus. But we all have asked that question. If you say you have never asked that question, why me? I will just blanketly say you're a liar. Because there has been times in your life that you have questioned why something bad happened to you. Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my family? Why are we sick? Why are they sick? Why did I lose my job? Why did my car break down? Why did I this or that or the other? And like I brought up two weeks ago, why would we not ask those questions? Uh, as much as we say, why me? Why would we not say, why not me? We are still human. We are still part of this world Yet we're different. Remember, we're called to be aliens of this world, that we don't belong here anymore. Once we've accepted Jesus into our heart, we no longer belong, but yet we still reside here for now for a purpose of glorifying Him and to bring others to that same understanding that they can have eternal life with Him. We are to be the ambassadors. We are to be the ones that, that tout that preach, that praise Jesus in such a way that people see it. Today we're going to talk about somebody again in the Old Testament because I just think it's a, a great story, just a, a little short story of someone. And I'm going to challenge you this morning. I'm going to start giving some illustrations of who this person was. Those of you here this morning in first service, if you say anything, I will throw my Bible at you, so don't give it away. All right? This guy was chosen by God at an early age. Any idea? The prophet, during this particular person's reign, or his work, uh, was Samuel. Any idea? He was chosen by Samuel, through God through Samuel, when God sent Samuel to this person's dad and said, out of his lineage will be the next ruler of Israel. Any idea? Samuel went, saw all these big, strong sons of the man, and he said, no, 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 no. You got any more? You got anybody else to choose from? And they're like, yeah, the punk kid's out in the field with the sheep. And Samuel said, go get him. And the punk kid came in, and he said, that's my man. He was then anointed to be a king, and that person is... David. We all know the story of David, right? David was a, ends up being a great king. He was a devout follower of God. We know that he killed the Philistine when none of the real warriors wanted to do anything because they were afraid. We're going to look at a story today of King David before he was king. In fact, he was still a, a, a young man. At this point, he had been chosen by God. He had been anointed. We know that King Saul, who was the first king of Israel because the people didn't like the judges anymore, they cried out, well, everybody else got a king. We want a king. And God said, are you sure? And they said, absolutely, because we want to be like everybody else. And he said, okay. Gave him Saul. Now, we know Saul started out pretty good until he became a buffoon and lost his melon. He became arrogant. He became conceited. And it says that his mind went dark. 
We know that at the point that we're going to talk about today, David had already killed the Philistine. Remember, here's a, an 8 to an 11 year old kid. We don't really know how old he was, but he would, he would come up and say, I can do this. As all the big, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I was never in the military. Yesterday, I had the opportunity and the honor of uh, doing a funeral for someone who was in the military. Uh, half the people in the audience had Vietnam uh, veteran hats on. I can just picture, they had pictures of this gentleman. He was in his 70s. Uh, they had pictures of him as a, a military guy. Young, strapping kid. You could just tell. He was strong, and he fought, and he did what he needed to do. I'm picturing that, like, here, all these guys standing around, all, like, beefcaked out with the big breastplates and the helmet, big swords, and they were all cowering and wetting themselves because they saw Goliath. Now, we know that Goliath, being a Philistine, was probably well over seven foot tall. Some say even maybe over eight foot tall. He was a giant. He was huge. But you would think a warrior would say, ah, I can do this. I have God on my side. I am an Israelite. I have been, our people have been chosen. And they did, and they're like, I can't do this. They were counting. And so a a 10-year-old kid comes up and goes, I got this. So they put him in all the armor, and it was just too much. He couldn't even walk. It was too heavy. His, the sword was probably twice as much as he weighed. And he got five stones, and he went and he took down because he had such great faith in the creator of all things. David was going to be a great king when his time came. But it wasn't his time yet. Saul's mind became, began to become more and more depraved. So what would happen is David actually played the liar, which this morning I found out that's like a little harp thing. I actually didn't even know what a liar was. I called a lot of people liars before, but I didn't know what a a musical instrument was. I guess it's like the little Cupid thing. Who knew? David would go, and the only solace that King Saul got in his depraved mind was when David would play the liar. It calmed him. It gave him peace. David would grow on, go on to do that for King Saul, Saul and, and, and encourage him, even though his mind was becoming more and more depraved, because here's the problem. The more that David did, the more that people loved him. In fact, they, they began singing songs about the future King David, which if you're the king and they're not singing songs about you, what's that going to do to you? Be honest. It's going to make you mad. Who's that stinking punk? I'm the king. I got the crown. Yet David was humble. David didn't throw that in Saul's face. But Saul saw David as a threat. So we're going to pick up in the story here where King Saul has been sending David out on military battles in the anticipation that he would be killed, but it didn't happen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. If not, it'll be up on the screen. 1 Samuel 19 is where we're going to be. And it says, Now Saul, King Saul, told Jonathan his son and all his servants to put David to death. Nice king, right? Can you imagine just walking down the road, you see a wanted sign with like the big thing through it, like, he, he, put a, he put out a, a hit on King David, or future King David. He wanted him dead because he no longer wanted to deal with this stinking little punk taking over his throne. Remember, he had a depraved mind. I, I just imagine at this point David going, what? Wh- why me? I've not done anything wrong. In fact, I I won our freedom from the Philistines by killing Goliath when all you other big strapping guys were like, ooh, king, he's big. Big wimps. He's like, I I come and play my lyre for you. I I help you relax. I help put you to sleep. What have I done? Why, Why are you trying to kill me? Some things that I want you to see out of the story today is that none of us are exempt from a why me moment. My question is, is what do you do in those why me moments? We know that David would often spend time with God. God found favor 
of David because of it. David trusted. David was not afraid to stand in front of an eight-foot guy with a stone and a sling because he knew his God was bigger. When we're going through those why me moments on this earth, you know, potentially lose your job, the car won't start, somebody in your family that you love is sick, you, why me? Well, again, I ask the question, why not you? Because no one is exempt from the evil of this world. The difference is, is we have a protector. We have someone on our side. And David had been chosen to do some work that God needed done. Here's the thing you need to understand, that if you have given your life to Christ, you have something to do for the kingdom of God. Many of you will never stand up and preach a sermon, and that's okay. But yet you are, because every day you wake up, you begin a sermon, Every night you go to bed, you have finished that sermon because everyone you've come in contact has either been touched by Christ or been touched by Satan through your actions. God cho chose David because he knew that he would do the will that he had set before him. Yeah, David made a mistake. He made a big mistake. Anybody here ever make a mistake? How about... Have you made a mistake in the last hour? Randy's made two. Yeah, because we're human and God understands that. But we are still called to be his children. We have given our life to him. David gave his all to him. He was anointed by Samuel to be the next king at an age that most of us would go, I, I couldn't do anything at the age of eight or ten. Or very few things. David was chosen to be king. If God calls you to it, he's going to get you through it. Do you trust that? Do you fall down on your knees and pray to him for that protection, that hedge of protection from, uh, uh, against the evil one? Do you pray against your heart becoming hardened and your mind becoming hardened? Because I don't know about you, when I've been in why me moments, I'm often either angry or frustrated or mad, sad. I, I have the gambit of emotions. You guys know me well enough. I wear my emotions on my sleeves. They're right there. You can see it. Just ask my kids. They know if dad's in a happy mood. It's in those times that I drop to my knees and realize I cannot do it on my own. David knew that he could not do this on his own. But the biggest thing I want you to see today is you can't do it on your own. But there might be somebody sitting next to you right now that can help you. See, here's the thing. Everyone in this room, if you call yourself a Christian, if you've given your life to Christ, then we are not just acquaintances. We are not just friends. You are my brothers and sisters. We're, we are family. Right? Right? We are. Now, I know families can be defunct and everybody's got that one uncle, you know, whatever. We won't go into that. But we're family. And what I want you to see in this story is even though there was not a blood relation between David and this other person, in essence, they were family. L let's keep reading. But Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, is seeking to put you to death. Now therefore, please be on your guard in the morning and stay in a secret place to hide yourself. Now I want you to stop and think about that for a minute. Think of the implications here. Jonathan is next to be king. He is the son of the king. If he gets rid of David, that crown is all but his. That promotion at work is all but his. All he has to do is let his father do the dirty work and he becomes king. Think about that. Think about how it was right there. He could be king over Israel. And he forsook the crown. He forsook his father because 
he loved David because of David's heart. I, I want you to think about that. Too many of us, I believe, don't reach out when we're struggling because we're like, oh, we don't want to be judged. We don't want somebody to know. We don't. I'm telling you, forget about it. Stop acting like you don't have or that nobody else in the world has problems and you're the only one because we all have problems and we are called to lean on one another. Have you ever sat down and prayed and go, God, give me an answer? And you go, he's not talking to me. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I'm not getting an answer. And then you talk to a Christian friend and everything, the light comes on and you go, those were the words I needed to hear. That was the encouragement I needed to stay strong and stay fast. David had that in Jonathan. Jonathan had the crown. I don't know about you. In today's day and age, they would have just whacked David themselves. Man, are you kidding me? I get to be king? Pfft. Who cares about David at this point? As Christians, we are called to, to be able to be leaned upon. Whether I have an issue or you have an issue. Too many times as Christians, we don't want to share with one another because we're afraid, oh, I don't want them to hear my dirty laundry. But if you don't share your dirty laundry, sometimes we don't know to pray for you. We don't know to lift you up, to ask God for that strength and that protection. I pray for all of you every week. I'm in here praying for those that have attended. I'm praying for those that didn't attend, whether because of illness or whatever. But if there's something specifically that I need to be on my knees for, don't be afraid to let me know. And if you don't want to tell me, that's fine. We've got elders, and there's a lot of other people in this church that you can call on and say, man, I just need, I need a brother. I need a sister. Would you pray with me? I will pray anywhere. I've prayed with people in the bathroom. I'm not going to go into more detail than that. But I will pray anywhere when I am given the opportunity to pray for somebody. There is never a bad time. Why? Because our God is always listening. We're, we're two or more are gathered. I will be in their presence. God is here right now. God is in spirit right here, right now, in us, around us, through us, and through his word. God loves us and wants to protect us, but we've got to cry out to him because if not, if we're not crying out to him, then what are we doing? We're doing it on our own. I can handle this. David, if he didn't have Jonathan, would have been dead within a day. I guarantee it. Because he would have known not to, he wouldn't have any idea that he needed to hide. Well, we see that. Let's keep going. I will go out and stand beside my father in a field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. And, and if I find out anything, then I will tell you. Then Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Do not let the king sin against his servant David, since he has not sinned against you, and since his deeds have been very beneficial to you. See, not only did Jonathan protect David, Jonathan stood up for David. Yeah, I'm sure you all know what that's like. Somebody's kind of talking bad about you and you get that one friend that stands up and goes, no, yeah, they do stupid things, but they're a good person. They're trying really hard. I, I don't know about you, I love encouragement. I do. Because I, I, I beat myself down. I think the biggest problem we have in America is not the psychosis that's going on in this world. I don't know about you, but all you got to do is turn on the news there's nothing good. I mean, let's think about it. What's the, what's the body count for this weekend between Chicago and New York and L.A. and Indianapolis? Suicides are on the rise. Marriages, they're now saying 75% of marriages fail. 75%, that's three quarters of marriages. And that's a blanket statement. Now, I'd love to say the 25 that are rock solid are the ones that are going to church, but that's not true either. Families are falling apart. There are people all over the world that are crying out, why me? Because they have no hope 
in Jesus. Why me? Yep. Garbage is going to happen to you here on this place, but here is not where I lay my treasure. Here's where I deal with giving somebody else the hope of Jesus. Because one day I'm not going to be here. You know, we, we talk about 12 people changed the world, that they, they had this impact as soon as Jesus arose and the 12 went out, that they spread the gospel of Jesus. Do you realize that you have an impact on somebody in, I don't know, um, Zimbabwe? I just like saying that. Do you realize you do? Because you never know what person you've talked to about Christ that then maybe go there for a job. Maybe they go to California or to Colorado and they're preaching the gospel because of you and then they preach to somebody who goes to Zimbabwe or Zaire or Russia or Ukraine. You don't know who you affect when you change their life because there's generations that go on after that. David was chosen to be king because he would lead Israel in accordance to God's will. Today, I'm asking you to lead in accordance to God's will. Be King David. And when you need somebody next to you, call somebody. Call a Christian friend that will give you Christian advice. We're also going to talk about Job. We'll get into that in a couple weeks. David didn't even know his life was in peril. But he had a friend. He had a godly friend that forsook all that he could gain, the glory, the honor, the crown, the jewels for his friend because he respected his friend, but he trusted in God. See, Jonathan was also a godly, godly man. And because of that, he knew that King David in his time would lead many. Now, this is not the only first time that we see David have a why me moment. Gosh, his own kids wanted to try to kill him. I mean, he was a wanted man his entire life from the minute he accepted Jesus uh, or God and started doing what God wanted. He was a wanted man. But he remained faithful in his why me moments because he had a friend. Today, family, my brothers and sisters, Call on one another. Pour your heart out. Get angry with them. And have them lift you up. See, this is what happened with this. For um, verse 5, for he took his life in his hand and struck the Philistine. He, this is Jonathan talking to Saul. He said, For he took his life in his, in his own hand. He struck the Philistine, and the Lord brought great deliverance for all of Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against an innocent blood by putting David to death without a cause? Saul, still listening to the voice of Jonathan, and Saul vowed, As the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. Then Jonathan called David. Jonathan told him all these words. Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was in the presence as formerly. All of us are going to have those times of why me moments. We just are. Even if we don't say the term why me, we'll think it. My question is, is what do you do with it? What have you done with it? And what will you do with it from now on? My encouragement to you is to seek God. David didn't even know, but somebody had his back. Somebody has your back now too. There are brothers and sisters here in this room, Jonathans we will call them, that want to pray with you, that want to pray for you, that want to lift you up, that want to help protect you. See, when we realize that the body of Christ is a family and comes together for the glory of God through each other, I think we'll be ten times stronger. And not so much stronger against the evil of this world, but we will be ten times stronger in order to glorify God. That's why David was called. Because he trusted and he glorified God. 
Do your actions in a why me moment glorify God? I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, mine not so much sometimes. But it drives me to my knees. It makes me open my phone up. Open my phone up. Wow, like I have a flip phone. Wow. It calls me to call someone else and say, I, I need you. I need you to be praying for me. I'm struggling. Uh, I, I don't know what's going on. There's something. I'm being attacked. S the problem is, is not only is, is it going to be a King Saul trying to kill you physically, but you've got a King Satan that is trying to kill you spiritually every day. So you chose God. You chose Jesus. And he wants you back. Every day we will be under attack. Not for the death of our body, but for the death of our soul. Who are you going to give it to? And when you fail, when you get frustrated and angry and you fall, cry out to God. Cry out to Him. David, before he went to the Philistine, just, he didn't go to the fridge and get a Mountain Dew and think of nothing of it. He prayed out to God. And God delivered him. Our deliverance may not be on this earth. We, we all know that one day we will leave this earth unless Jesus comes back. But our deliverance will be an eternity with him. Again, I don't know where your retirement plan lays. My retirement plan is in heaven. And if your retirement plan is there, Satan can do nothing to you because as much as he may beat you down or put King Saul's in your way, you're an alien to this world. You are different. So act different. It's okay to be different. I'm very different. And I'm good with that. Why? Because I am no longer a, a person of this world. I am Christ's son. When we understand who we belong to, the Goliaths that come in your life and come before you are nothing compared to the creator of all things. And God has my back. God's got my front. God's got my sides. God is my protector. And all of you are my Jonathans. Today, remember, Encourage one another. Watch out for one another. Lift one another up. There should be no division in God's family. Jonathan could have had the crown and said, no, I will follow the will of God and I will protect my next king. Today, are you going to protect King Jesus' name when you go out in public? Or you, will you grab the crown for yourself? Because there's no place for that. Whose crown are you going to wear? Father, we thank you for this uh, just short story, really, of, of David. We thank you, Father, for the words that are here. But we thank you, Father, for seeing that we, we are not alone. In this story, I just see Jonathan as the main player, this, this man that could have had everything the world had to offer. And yet he said that your will, God, is more important. He said, my friend is more important than me. Father, today, if anyone here is going through a why me moment, I pray, Father, that you would just bring Jonathan's around him or her, and raise them up that they seek you clearly. I pray for a hedge of protection around them from the evil one. As he's trying to always beat us down, Father, I pray that you would raise them up above that. Father, I pray that we would be restored to you in the times that we fall. And that through all of it, that you are glorified in that one day, one day, we will be with you forever. 
Today, Father, I pray that you would just heal those that are sick. I pray for marriages that are falling apart. I feel, pray for families that are fall, fall, falling apart. I pray, Father, for people that are falling apart. I pray that they find the hope in Jesus and all that he did and accomplished on the cross. Today, Father, I pray that you would use us to be Jonathan to those around us, to raise them up, to see your glory, and to see the ability that we have to be a child of the King. Today, Father, I pray that you would use us as Jonathan was used to glorify you. We ask this all in the blessed and awesome name of Jesus. Amen.